All right. Welcome to the DDPS seminar, everyone. Before we introduce our invited speaker, let's go over some rules and logistics. Um, I have two um, announcements. First, uh, please mute yourself during the talk, but if you have questions, you can unmute and ask questions or use chat room to post your questions so that we can address them in Q&A session. And finally, today's DDPS seminar is open to external audiences. Um, therefore, no classified discussion is allowed, so please watch out. Uh, that's about it. Now, let me briefly introduce our speaker today. It is an honor to host Dr. Uh, Yasamen Bari, who is a research scientist at Google DeepMind with research interests at the interface of statistical physics, machine learning, and condensed matter physics. In recent years, she has worked on the foundations of deep learning from a physics perspective. She has been an invited lecturer at the last Houcher School of Physics and was a co-organizer of a recent program at the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics. Previously, she received a PhD in physics at UC Berkeley. Today, Yasaman will talk about a first principle approach to understanding deep learning. I'm sure we are going to hear a wonderful talk. Now, um, let me ask a somewhat informal questions to Yasaman just to get to know you better, Yasaman. So my question, as I uh, warn you, uh, will be, you have a very interesting background. You, you have a physics major, pure physics major, I assume. Yes. And then how you are uh, in, you know, computational science and specifically the machine learning and AI. How did it happen? It happened uh, somewhat organically. So my my PhD thesis was indeed on um, kind of pure physics and theoretical physics in um, quantum condensed matter physics. Um, but condensed matter physics has a long history of um, condensed matter physicists have a long history of kind of going into other disciplines and there's really a broad notion of what constitutes condensed matter physics. Um, it turns out that in the past, uh, historically, condensed matter physicists have also studied um, neural networks as a part of the study of disordered systems. And that's something that you kind of was alluded to in the Nobel Prize in physics uh, that was awarded this year. Um, I got interested in it organically while I was still at Berkeley. Um, I kind of started to go to seminars in the computer science department and heard about all this. And at that time, all of the um, empirical advancements. And um, at that time, uh, there, uh, um, something that kind of came to the fore was it. A, a lot of people saying that it would, how important it would be to try to understand at least something about what these models are doing. Um, and so um, that as a scientific problem is how I got started in the field. And so I kind of uh, worked on that problem um, a bit more from like a physics angle, either with methods from physics or physics flavored um, types of questions. Um, and then more recently, I've kind of uh, wanted to also explore, kind of go back a bit into um, uh, applications of, of machine learning to, um, uh, to areas of the sciences that I know, like condensed matter, materials, uh, molecular systems, and that's more of a, uh, more recent development that I won't talk about, um, but kind of bringing them back together. And that second part is uh, partly also, I think, inspired by a lot of the advancements I've seen um, now having worked at um, DeepMind or Google, first Google Brain and DeepMind for some time, um, just seeing those advancements and what they can do. Mm, nice, nice. Well, um, yes, as you said, uh, the first Nobel Prize from the, the machine learning um, person uh, from the Nobel Prize Physics, and I I hope that's going to happen more often. And someday, maybe Yasam and you are, you are going to be a Nobel Prize recipient from, from the physics field. Okay, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you, Yangsu, for the kind um, introduction and the invitation. Um, so the the focus of this talk will really be, um, as the title says, taking a first principles approach to trying to understand deep learning. So rather than talk about methods specifically from the physical sciences, I'd like to just give a little bit of a survey or overview of some of my work and more broadly things that would be interesting for 
scientists who work with data driven methods in general and and um, and how at least there's been some progress made in understanding some pieces of this big landscape of um, you know, big design space of neural networks and AI, where there are just so many knobs and so many choices to make, at least something about some of that has been understood recently. And I'd like to share a little bit of that with you um, in, in hopes that it might um, kind of influence maybe your research uh, in, in the physical sciences as well. So, um, as you all know, you know, there's this uh, um, ever persistent promise of machine learning and AI and also some um, real successes uh, from the past few years um, in, in the sciences. Uh, as you know, in protein structure prediction, like the AlphaFold model, um, and uh, developing neural network-based DFT functionals, for example, um, and as well as uh, developing increasingly large language models that can do some amounts of math and science reasoning. Um, uh, in, in certain domains and certain types of problems. Um, so these have all been um, big advancements from uh, big models in the last few years. Um, but I'm going to now maybe take a different um, angle to in this talk, which is uh, what do we understand about deep learning and how it works and how to design models? Um, and um, I would say, along with all this empirical progress that has happened, I feel that on the understanding side, um, we're uh, quite a bit behind. Um, and, you know, just a few years ago at one of the main ML, major ML conferences, uh, you know, one of the invited speakers very famously made this illusion that deep learning is not really a science or an engineering, it's alchemy. It's just mixing things, you know, um, designing models in a somewhat unprincipled way without, you know, the designer knowing exactly what will work or what won't and having some basic principles. Um, so I think, uh, you know, the unanticipated success of using neural networks as models uh, forces us to consider some new questions and also revisit some old ones from just machine learning from the past few decades. So the types of questions I want to kind of address in this talk are what can we say about what neural networks actually learn, um, if anything at all? Um, so this pr problem turns out to be solvable in certain regimes, which can be useful. Um, why is it that neural networks with more and more parameters perform better? So there's been this trend uh, in the field to make A models bigger and often either models wider or wider and deeper uh, and so on. Um, and this kind of runs counter to this old intuition from um, just statistics, but as as scientists, uh, when you think about fitting um, uh, any data, the more parameters you use, you worry about overfitting. And somehow this runs completely counter, um, this, this trend runs completely counter to that. And then the third question is, what controls the gains from scaling up deep neural networks? as we increase the amount of data or the size of the model uh, and so on. So in the first part, I just want to give a bit of an overview of a topic that I've worked on, but that I think is more broadly, could be broadly useful to um, scientists who uh, also do a lot of scientific modeling, um, which is uh, some uh, results, some correspondences that we built between neural networks and uh, Gaussian processes, which um, I won't describe in a lot of detail, but maybe some of you are familiar with um, it's kind of sort of a very different modeling paradigm um, to uh, uh, to uh, the training of neural networks. Um, so uh, just to set up the basic problem, um, uh, let me consider a uh, just a vanilla neural network, but we can do this for a lot of different architectures, uh, a fully connected deep neural network, which has a certain depth, L, to the computation that it does, and it has a certain um, hidden layer width, N, which is essentially how many uh, computations it's doing in parallel at the same time. Um, and so uh, we can describe, you know, what the, the computation done by this network is a recursion relationship where the function F is a function of the original input data X coming in. Um, uh, and we take the signal f l minus one, which is also a function of x, let's say at um, coming in here, 
we pass it through a nonlinearity phi, we multiply by weight matrices, uh, which are our learnable parameters in this network and maybe a bias. And uh, we do that to construct the um, signal at the next layer. And this continues through the, through the network. So this computation, um, as I mentioned, it has a depth to it and it has a network width um, where here you uh, sum over um, all these contributions from the different hidden nodes or neurons from the previous layer. Um, now, in general, being, say, being able to say something about this computation is pretty challenging. Uh, it depends on, on a lot of the hyperparameters. But it turns out that at large n in this, um, so when you take the limit of a large number of um, hidden nodes or neurons, uh, the description of the system simplifies. Um, uh, so you can kind of see that through the central limit theorem um, and or, or, or um, other more rig rigorous techniques, but essentially what happens is at large n, um, uh, you sum over uh, very many uh, variables here. Um, and that sum you can, uh, when, when you start with, at least at the, at the beginning of training, a random network um, will involve the sum over many random variables. And you can imagine how you apply central limit theorem to that um, to be able to describe the process F. So this kind of ties in, basically it's uh, studying the statistical physics of large and deep neural networks at the moment, just when they're randomly initialized. So we're just, at, we're, you can think of it as being at the beginning of training, we um, initialize the, the, the parameters uh, randomly, and then we wanna be able to describe the system. But I'll talk about training in just a minute, because it turns out we, uh, you can just easily then um, get to that uh, as well. Um, so this is also, you can think of it as a type of mean field theory that becomes exact uh, in the infinite width limit. So the, the, the conclusion is that at the large, in the large n limit, when, when the network width is wide enough, this is well described by a Gaussian process, this neural network. And uh, what we need to describe a Gaussian process is just um, a mean and a covariance function. Um, that, so it's just described by its low order statistics. So uh, it turns out that that's also pretty natural easy to calculate. So there's some recursion that happens on the space of functions as you uh, go through one layer of the network to another, which I just described. It's this iterative computation. Um, but if you were going to calculate the covariance function, so the expectation of f of x times f of x prime averaged over the network, this is what you need to be able to um, describe the uh, to, to construct the kernel function of the Gaussian process, it turns out that that also obeys a recursion relation. Um, so for from F0, you can compute a K0, from F1, you can compute a K1, and so on, until you get to a final K. This covariance function or kernel function is a function of um, two inputs, X and X prime. So just as a, uh, uh, maybe a reminder, so a Gaussian process I mentioned needs a mean function and a covariance function. The mean function in this setting is just zero. The covariance function is a function of two arguments, x and x prime. It tells you roughly how similar x and x prime are after you perform this series of computations. And there's a recursion relationship that you can get for k that exactly mirrors the one we wrote down for f because it's done iteratively, it, it, it um, uh, inherits the uh, computation that the neural network uh, inherently is doing. So this is a way, um, a, a natural way in which a Gaussian processes and kernels arise from neural networks uh, naturally. And they have a certain structure that's different from kernels or Gaussian processes that were known before um, because they have this compositionality in them. And, you know, classic Gaussian processes in, in the literature and textbooks, if you look at them, um, have a very different uh, structure. They're usually constructed from simpler functions, and they're not compositional in this way that I described.
So now that was the study of random networks, but once you map the problem over to a Gaussian process, and that description is exact as I mentioned in that limit, and it's a good description if the layer width is large enough, then uh, it's easy to do Bayesian learning from that. Um, so if you have a data set D um, and you'd like to make Bayesian predictions from this neural network in this large width limit, you can essentially do that through this Gaussian process. Um, for example, uh, th so these are now well-written, you know, uh, kind of textbook Gaussian processes. There are equations uh, that um, you can look up for what the prediction would be after learning on a certain amount of data um, for, the, for the network or for the model. So for example, the output of the function on some new point X is, it's, it's a probabilistic computation, so it's described by some distribution. In this case, it's a normal distribution with a mean and a variance that you can write down analytically. And for example, the mean is just gotten by computing this linear algebra um, you know, computation on the, tar on the original targets, y, at the data points that you have, and doing some linear algebra using this kernel function that I described on the prior slide. So for every network, every neural network that you have, you have this kernel function k. You can compute it on your training data, just as you would for other Gaussian processes, and then you can use that to make predictions. And so this became a way of um, obtaining Bayesian predictions that are exact from an infinitely wide deep neural network. And pictorially, um, for those of you, just as a maybe reminder of, of Bayesian kind of methods and what a Gaussian process does, um, you know, it's, it's probabilistic. So before you learn from data, you have some kind of distribution over the values of the function um, uh, with some mean and some variance. But after you learn from data, your function kind of reduces its error around those data points to match the values y that it's regressing to. And then there's some remaining variance in the places in input space where you don't have a lot of data, but you would need to um, you know, have more constraints to, to do better learning. And so in summary, this was kind of a few year program essentially to um, take neural networks of different architectures. So this zoo of architectures that exists out there um, with all sorts of different models and um, derive in this uh, large end limit, the Gaussian process and kernels that, that um, originate from those. And we did that at the very beginning with um, our very first paper on just the fully connected neural network, which gives rise to some kernel K, which I label FC, just to just to say that it, it it's um, tied to the architecture of a fully connected neural network. You can do something similar with a convolutional neural network. So these are often used uh, in vision problems. Um, there, the notion of what is n, what is the large width limit, is slightly different. It's the number of filters that you use. But again, it's always corresponding to this sequential process, uh, sorry, parallel processing that you're doing in every layer at the same time. You can also do it for models with attention layers that are now um, used in, you know, it's kind of like the backbone of language models. You can do it with residual networks that have skip connections. You can also do it with graph neural networks um, as well. And so um, this kind of had a, a number of implications. So I've focused here more on the methodology that originate that um, uh, was one of the consequences of these mappings. So now you have Gaussian processes and kernels that you can just use. And it turned out that they were, um, at the time, state-of-the-art um, Gaussian processes compared to like older traditional uh, GPs. Um, for example, the the fully connected one uh, that we published at the at the begin um, some time ago, uh, at the time was was uh, like a state of the art um, GP, and sa same with convolutional. And again, I think this uh, the the reason for this um, is that it's a richer class of kernels or GPs because it has this compositional 
hierarchical processing that comes from the neural network that usual Gaussian processes with um, simple kernels like radial, like Gaussian kernels or you know radial basis functions don't have. So one aspect of this, as I mentioned, was a uh, one consequence of uh, this program was methodological. So now we have these methods um, that we can use um, uh, in lieu of traditional Gaussian processes. Um, the second, which I won't go into, was it kind of gave rise on the theoretical side to the to uh, even more work on these large width limits. And so there have been a lot of consequences coming from that as well, which I won't get, get into, but but um, some of those highlights have been that the community was able to actually solve for the dynamics of optimization exactly in that limit. So there are other very closely related kernels that you can write down and construct that describe what happens under optimization in this large width limit. And so this has given people um, a theoretical handle on the problem in that limit. It also has given rise to kind of a whole subfield in, in machine learning having to do with uh, setting um, parameterizing networks layer widths, layers in, in a right way. So as to either be close to this limit or not be close to this limit. And I won't get into that either, but just al allude to this fact that this has kind of gone off and, and evolved into other directions as well. Um, on the methodological side, I'll say that, um, so I talked more about the theory, but if you're interested in using um, any of these models, uh, there was sort of a, a larger effort um, at Google to um, construct a library that would allow you to easily implement these kernels um, and Gaussian processes uh, kind of in, um, in correspondence with neural network layers. So in the same way that we have libraries for neural network layers where we can define you know, a fully connected layer or convolutional layer and so on, um, now you can uh, do that um, in a way to, you can define networks and at the same time define these kernels and be able to compare them sort of apples to apples. Um, JAX is a really nice um, framework also developed at Google. So this library, the neural tangents library is written in JAX um, and it's very uh, easy to use. Um, so I encourage everyone to play around with it. Um, you just import its neural network library and you can define a neural network here, uh, like a sequence, for example, of uh, just weight matrices and ReLU function nonlinearities and be able to obtain both the kernel function and the actual neural network function, train them, and then compare compare them. And so we did this also pretty systematically across different architectures. Um, and for each case, it turns out that uh, whether the finite size neural network or the infinite width kernel uh, does better really depends on the architecture and the, and the type of data. So for example, you may, uh, this might run counter to your wisdom, but um, in the case of fully connected neural networks, it turns out that, that the kernels do pretty well on like these simple benchmark data sets coming from the, the, the vision, you know, very simple uh, image classification data sets. Um, and I think one reason for that is because fully connected neural networks at finite size are actually not very good models. They don't have rich inductive biases. They don't have a lot of structure that's actually relevant for the physical world. Um, and so the infinite width neural network is something that has infinitely many basis functions in it. And it actually does either on par or as well, you know, as well as the finite size neural network. Now, what we found was if you go to other architectural classes like convolutional neural networks, which do have structure, more structure in them that's well suited for the physical world, then the finite size neural networks do do better than the kernels. Um, but it's also important that you have enough data for that to be true. So a general um, trend that um, is now kind of known in the field or uh, has kind of grown out of that is, is that these finite size neural networks that, that we're all using today 
do do really well, but you do really need um, a certain amount of data for that to be true. And if you're in a low data regime, you actually, it may not be the case that a model which is infinitely large and is just a kernel, since that's a somewhat, uh, it's a very particular class of models, uh, a model that is just a kernel can actually do, that corresponds to the same structure of the finite size neural network can actually do as well. So there's some crossover between, as a function of the amount of data that you have, between whether a kernel method is good and whether a neural network um, is good. So that's sort of a high level uh, takeaway from the systematic comparisons of basically having a one-to-one -one correspondence between infinite size models and their finite size versions. And their finite size versions, when, when you know, as I, just to reiterate, when you do have um, rich structure in the model, that matches that of the physical world, the finite size network does do better because it adapts its basis functions to the data and a kernel does not do that. Warren, can I ask a quick question? Like, uh, do, uh, how many parameters does this equivalent Gaussian process kernel have? Like, uh, so because that seems to be the key issue for data, right? So, um, so uh, do you have any um, comment on that? So it only has, in terms of tunable parameters, yeah. uh, these would the hyperparameters. It would have just, for example, in these vanilla settings, um, uh, just the like a. I didn't write it on the slide, I guess, but a like a weight variance and a bias variance. So two constants, that come from sort of the scale that you want to choose for your prior on W and a scale for the prior on the Bs, and a lot of the ones we tested were kind of this. There are essentially two parameter Gaussian processes, then we tune those two hyperparameters. But the neural network does have, in principle, a few more design choices as well that we tune. Okay. Okay. And that, that's where the more data requirements come from, but, you know, for the neural network? Um, no, the more data requirements seem to come from, well, it, it's actually not well understood theoretically, or just why, but it's more of an empirical observation where if you're, the, the thing with a kernel is that it has, um, if a neural network is allowed to learn, um, yeah, if, I guess, I, I guess I would agree, maybe that is a way of stating it. Um, you need more data to, it's better if you can adapt your basis functions quite a lot to the data. But in order to do that, you do need more data. Okay, yeah. Thanks. That's sort of the, yeah, maybe, um, maybe the, the, the rough idea. Thanks. Um, any other questions? I don't see anyone hands up, so you can go home. So, um, so that kind of uh, is just was an overview of this area um, uh, in case you want to read more about it or use some of the tools. Um, now I'll just switch gears to a different um, uh, kind of more recent evolution, which is uh, trying to understand scaling laws in, um, in machine learning models in general, but particularly neural network models, and especially when they're large. And so I'll give a bit of an overview on that um, as well. So, um, you know, you have these basic knobs in machine learning that you can tune um, to adjust the performance of an ML model. So amount of training data that you have, which is often small in scientific applications is, is one of them, but you also have the size of the model as well as the amount of time you wanna train for. Um, or another way to state that is um, you can change units, especially, essentially, and instead study the amount of computational resources you have to devote to that. So like the amount of flops uh, that you, you would like in a computation. And um, nowadays in the era of, at least in the, in the space of um, very large machine learning models, um, there were a few empirical observations a, a few years ago that kind of just highlighted um, a, a very simple trend, but one that's very useful to measure, which is just that uh, the 
uh, quality of your model as measured by the test loss after training um, seems to improve uh, rather monotonically as a function of any one of these uh, variables in the problem. So the amount of um, computational resources you have, the amount of training data, and the number of parameters. And these trends uh, sometimes, although not always, uh, seem to be like power laws with certain exponents to that scaling. Um, there are, of course, other knobs that you can also tune, which I won't discuss, uh, like the quality of the data, um, how heterogeneous it is, and what mixtures you should take. Um, but for now, I'll just focus on these um, uh, empirical observations. Um, some other examples of this, which uh, you might be familiar with, uh, are uh, also in the um, uh, in the space of large language models. So, um, you know, GPT-3, um, one of the things that was uh, originally observed about it was um, that, you know, certain uh, performance benchmarks can, can improve monotonically as a function of, say, the um, size of the model or the amount of data and so on. But there's other regimes, um, other uh, uh, types of problems where you can have sort of discontinuous uh, behavior. Um, and so, for example, um, one of the observations was if you take, um, uh, let's say you take some relatively smaller model and you look at um, the accuracy as a function of the amount of examples that you give in context to this model. So now we're thinking of language models. They have some, they're trained on some pre-training data set, some corpus, but um, uh, they can do in-context learning. So after they're trained, you can give them some few examples. Um, you know, that's how you interact with, say, chat, G, uh, chat GPT or any of these large language models available now. You give a few examples, um, which is, uh, you know, the number of examples in context, and you can look at the, how the performance improves as a function of the number of examples in the context. And um, sometimes what, what, was, well, what was observed was that if you um, uh, continue increasing the size of the model, uh, there's a point at which you actually get some discontinuous behavior um, as a function of the number of examples in the context. So for this ultra large, almost absurdly large, you know, uh, model, what you find is that the accuracy uh, uh, as a function of the amount of data in the context uh, improves um, and then uh, kind of transitions to a, to a different slope but at large, much larger values of the accuracy as you give it more and more examples. So this is the kind of behavior that at least model designers in this, in this other regime, which I know is uh, somewhat different from scientific applications, which are much more small scale. Um, but this is sort of the regime that people are working in nowadays in the space of uh, large language models or even uh, models like AlphaFold and so on, which have a lot of training data and, and very large size. Um, but uh, there's a lot of empirical work, essentially, to try to figure out the best way to scale up a model. So if you have some amount of resources that you want to devote to training a model, um, uh, let's say you have a fixed amount of computational resources that you're willing to spend, then there's an optimal way to allocate that those resources uh, to either to some amount you you should pick the amount of training data that you need um, uh, in a specific way, and you can pick the model size in a specific way. And there's some trade-off. If your model, for example, is too small relative to the amount of data that you have, then you may not actually be getting uh, all of uh, being able to you're not able to extract all the information that you could from that data set or vice versa. If your training set is too small relative to the size of your model, you don't actually have enough information for the, you know, the, the richness of the model. You have many more parameters that you could be using that you're not essentially using. So there is a bit of a trade-off here, and, and the community uh, has been looking at um, uh, figuring out the best ways to scale up so that it's compute optimal. Um, 
I won't go too much into the details of what we've looked at, but we we uh, uh, did some theoretical work, um, essentially trying to analyze uh, what gives rise to these scaling laws. What, what controls these trends? And this is important for any model, even in the physical sciences. So often you're interested in the physical sciences is in you have a fixed amount of data and you just wanna know how good is the model right now, the quality of the fit. But it could be that you're in a situation, maybe you're working with experimentalists or something where you could uh, potentially obtain more data over time, let's say. And then the model that you would want to choose is actually not the model that has the best fit right now. It's the model that whose rate of improvement is actually pretty good as well. So it's just another metric to look at um, because you might be able to do more with, with such a model if you had just a little bit more data or just a little bit bigger model uh, in terms of its size. So um, I'll maybe just uh, skip a bit over this since it's maybe a bit um, too much kind of in the uh, there's there might be a question on the chat, but I'll 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 I won't go into the details of this just to say that we looked at this problem theoretically, um, uh, looking at the loss as a function of the amount of data D, and for us the model size, but it was um, related to the width of the neural network, and we were able to derive these power laws. Um, as a function of the amount of data D or the model size, and they have certain exponents, which is what I'm highlighting in color. So that's telling you about this rate of improvement, alpha D or alpha W. Um, the short of it is, is that one of the things we found, um, which I can summarize as a just high level rule of thumb, is that if you have, if you're looking at scaling one of these parameters on its own, either the amount of data that you have or the size of the model, so D or N. There are different regimes of scaling that kick in. So what, hap what happens is that if you're um, scaling up, if you have these two variables D and the variable N, um, one of them will be the bottleneck in the scaling. So let's say um, it's, it's a very intuitive rule, but um, let's say uh, you're in this regime. So um, the amount of data you have relative to the size of the model, where this constant is not something we know, but it's, it's some uh, you know, rough regime where, where this is true. Then if you look at the data, sites, data, says, data set size scaling, D, so what happens if my model is large, I'm, um, I have a certain amount of data and I wanna increase the amount of, what would happen if I increase the amount of data? You get some particular exponent alpha D. We call this, we gave this, this regime a name, it's called resolution limited. It has to do with how well you resolve the data manifold, essentially. So this exponent alpha D is actually pretty complicated. It depends both on the data and the neural architecture. And I'll mention, I'll give some few examples of what controls this power law. Um, the exact same idea is true if you now switch the roles of the variables. So now let's say you're in this regime where you have a lot of data, you have a small model, and you're just looking at the what happens when you scale the size of the model. Again, the model size is the bottleneck and you get some exponent alpha W, which is complicated in general, you, one should go measure it, um, but, uh, but it has to do with, again, this resolution of, of a data manifold. But if you're in this other regimes, which I'm in this table, I'm putting on the diagonals. So for example, if you're in this regime where uh, you have a certain model size and you have a lot of training data, if you keep increasing the amount of data, uh, your exponent, the rate at which you improve is actually just some fixed constant equal to one. So the gains you know, from this are kind of uh, potentially a, a marginal or not. Um, and and uh, something similar happens when you again reverse the two variables. So at a high level, this is all just to say that you can partition this space of 2D space of data scaling and model scaling into different regimes, you can categorize them. 
And you can understand that certain regimes are actually A, quite related to each other, and B, you can understand what controls the scaling in those regimes. And then there are other regimes where it really has to do with how well you model the data manifold uh, and so on. So these are just empirical results to kind of demonstrate that we see these exponents alpha equal to one in these diagonal regimes, regardless of what the problem is. So these are like different data sets, different models. They all improve at the same rate, alpha equal to one. Same with this down here, but on the off diagonals, which correspond to these other regimes, we see very problem dependent exponents. So that's sort of the high level takeaway. Um, I'll say one final thing, which is that the power laws in these regimes uh, on the off, di off diagonals that you have are actually related to power laws that you see in the data. So if you take and this is maybe more details than uh, uh, something I'll get into. But if you take those kernels that I showed you alluded to earlier in the beginning of the talk, um, and if we want to just study, let's say, the scaling of a Gaussian process or of a kernel method, it turns out you can understand that pretty well. And it's very related to um, the properties of the kernel when it's evaluated on training data. So, for example, imagine that I take one of the kernels, let's say the kernel from the fully connected network that I had earlier um, in, in, in the large width derivation. And I just want to understand uh, what is the data scaling of a model with that kernel like? What controls that? Um, this is actually a better understood problem. And in this case, you can actually be pretty precise about what controls it. One of the big factors is just the eigenvalue spectrum of that kernel uh, matrix when you evaluate it on the training data. And if you look at real data, one of the properties, unlike many theoretical models, is that one of the properties it displays is that it has a power law dependence. So if I look at the eigenvalues lambda i as a function of i, there's some power law behavior as a function of the index i of the eigenvalue. That power law depends on the difficulty of the data set and um, the structure of the kernel. So here, just to tune the complexity of the data, what we're doing is coarse graining image data. So, um, so for example, uh, as, as we go from 1 to 14, what we're doing is taking images and, av you know, um, uh, uh, coarse graining them, so just averaging them locally until we produce images of lower and lower resolution. And that produces, uh, that's as we uh, go up to these pink numbers. And that changes the spectrum of the kernel because it changes the complexity of that data set and the task that you have to perform, which is interpreting uh, either a high resolution image or a low resolution image. So this is all just to just to say that um, or highlight that these how a model scales its scaling behavior and these power laws um, in some of these regimes where it's very data dependent and it depends on the data manifold can be tied back to power laws that originate in real natural data. Like the real world has power law data in it when you look at um, uh, what it looks like in these covariance functions or kernel functions. Okay, I'll um, maybe skip over some of the predictions um, that come. There's there's more details of, of our theory and what we predict. Um, but again, the, the takeaway is we can observe um, these different regimes with exponent alpha equal to one, as well as exponents that are very different and uh, dependent on the problem, as you see here, alpha D that is uh, around 0.2, alpha p again around 0.2. This is now in a setting which involves pre-training and fine-tuning, so it's a pretty uh, practically relevant setting. So I'll skip over these. I'll just say that there's also these connections between scaling and the dimensionality, effective dimensionality of the data manifold. And so um, we've done, we had done experiments where we looked at the correlation between the data scaling exponent and the dimensionality of the data manifold. And um, essentially, alpha D goes as 1 over 
the effective dimension uh, of the problem. And you can see for different data sets, at least there's a rough correlation in that um, uh, the, the larger the, the dimensionality, uh, the harder the problem um, and, and the scaling. So um, just a few other empirical observations that might um, interest you, again, if, if uh, uh, you were to, to look at scaling for any models that, that you work with. Um, but modifying the task affects the scaling, um, of course. Uh, so, um, for example, let me point to this example on the right. If you corrupt data with noise, then um, it becomes more difficult. And the scaling of that same model as you increase the noise, so those are the kind of the blue numbers, the scaling uh, uh, worsens both the num both the curves shift upwards, but their slope also changes. So the efficiency of the model on that data set is much worse. On the other hand, if you actually just change the task to be something that's kind of semantically very similar to the original task, you don't change the efficiency. Uh, at least within these experiments, you just shift the um, um, curves up and down. Um, you can also look at architectural differences within uh, certain families of neural network models. So this is like a very classic ML setup where you have a wide ResNet model. Um, it's a family of models that you can make deeper or wider, and you can look at the scaling uh, on uh, real data sets. And um, what you find is depth, again, kind of roughly shifts the curves up and down, but if you change the width, uh, quite a lot, and as you make the network wider, it actually uh, has a worse slope. Actually, this is connected to what I mentioned earlier about the, the efficiency of kernels compared to neural network models. Um, what these curves essentially are doing is uh, the pink one is, say, a neural network model of a particular width, and as we um, increase the width, we actually get closer to these kernel regimes, and kernels don't scale as efficiently as neural networks once you have enough data. And you can see that worse efficiency here, um, data efficiency in, in this blue uh, line. Finally, I'll just mention that um, another uh, kind of very connected emerging area um, is how can we, how can you do better than the power laws that you have um, that are kind of fixed you're stuck with depending on the model that you choose and your data set. And um, there, it's known that you could beat these scaling laws, the power law form, if you subselect your data in a very strategic manner. So if like somehow you knew which data would be the right ones to select, you could actually get this kind of sigmoidal um, improvement as a function of the amount of data um, it levels off at some point, but for very small data sets, that means that it's much better to actually, um, you know, strategically subselect the data rather than use all the data that you have kind of randomly sampled IID from, from your set. And so figuring out the way to do this is sort of a, it's a um, continuing area of research, but something to, to keep in mind, especially when you, um, when you are in these data limited regimes or you can, you know, wisely choose um, the data or where to sample um, if you're doing active learning and so on um, in these in these settings. Okay, um, so maybe just to summarize kind of the two portions of this talk um, and thanks for your uh, patience and interest because this was more focused on sort of like what are the foundational principles we kind of understand um, on uh, on. Uh, of neural networks and, and ML at the moment. And I just wanted to kind of reiterate these two, which was the first was that neural architectures, a very general class of neural network models, different architectures, all naturally give rise to Gaussian processes and rich compositional kernels that can be useful as methods. They're more useful in low data regimes where traditionally Gaussian processes and kernels are used. Um, I think if you're gonna, if you do use such models, it's worth considering these compared to compared to traditional Gaussian processes with traditional kernels, because there's a good chance 
um, these might do pretty well for your application. Um, uh, like one, one other difference in addition to the compositionality that I actually forgot to mention is that these kernels um, are non-local kernels. You know, local kernels um, like a natural radial basis function. So it 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 gives larger weight to to inputs in the feature space that are closer together. Um, but neural networks and their associated kernels are in some ways um, more powerful models because it allows you to give a correlation, a similarity to features that are potentially very different in their original input space, even though they're similar in some higher dimensional nonlinear space. So non-locality is actually another um, way in which these kernels are different than kind of uh, traditional kernels. Um, they can be useful for Bayesian modeling if you want principled uncertainty estimates um, or marginal likelihood, likelihood estimates and so on. And then the second uh, topic that I talked about was thinking about scaling laws. So kind of just the changing perspective from not just how well does the model do right now with my fixed setting of a fixed amount of data and a fixed model size, but if I change these knobs just a little bit, um, uh, which models are actually more efficient? And if I could get to that regime, then they would actually be better models. So that as a, is another angle for model comparison. Um, and then also thinking about data selection strategies so that you can uh, scale better than the kind of default power law scaling that um, that you would have if you if you just sampled data randomly IIT. And with that, um, I think I will just thank you for your interest, and that kind of wraps up everything I wanted to um, to tell you about um, today. Thank you, fantastic, uh, SMM. Um, wonderful talk. Um, you know. But we have a quick questions. Um, I don't know if you can see that or not, but uh, let's start from the Elon's questions. Um, Elon, I, if you are there, um, would you mind you, you know, unmute yourself and ask your questions? If not, I can. <laughs> is the sum form, uh, when you talk about the scaling law, uh, he was asking, is the sum form really the optimal? He was asking, how about the product power law, like product form instead of the sum form. Oh, can, um, is there a chance to see the questions actually? Is, uh, you... Yes, well, there is a, if you go to the top of the, yes, there is a options on the top. And okay. then there's Here. a chat, chat, yes, yes. If you open that window, then you will see all the all the questions in the chat. Oh, I see. Okay. Did you see that? Yes, great. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, let's start from the Elon's, the very first one. He's asking, is the sum form really the optimal fit? That's a great, How about a product? That's yeah. a great question. It may not be. So what people have observed is usually um, in, in a lot of the regimes that they've studied, I think the dominant ones are first the sums. Like first you treat them semi-independently, but there might be correction terms that have to do with this product. So by no means is is the form that I wrote down kind of the the um, ground truth, tried and true form. Um, it's more like functional fits that people have done. And for certain problems, it might be that indeed um, adding that product form uh, is actually uh, very important and, and very good fit. It just seems to be the case that for a lot of these cases, the additive form is a, is is kind of a dominant good fit. Natural form. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Our next question is by Cole. He's asking, could you comment on the divergent behavior in the bottom left figure of the taxonomy? Uh, you, you know what he's talking about? The uh, four, let's four see. figures. I th yes, I think this one. Yes. yes. It looks like the power loss diverge from the data as one scales to larger width, which is different from the other figures that show continuing improvement. Yes, that's also a great observation. Great question. Um, it's, it's actually just an artifact of this experiment. So um, this experiment is kind of done, really these regimes that I've talked about are kind of asymptotic regimes. We don't have a lot of control when N is of the order of D. 
So there's this crossover that happens in between these two regimes. And that crossover regime is actually um, described and kind of known to be described by double descent like phenomenon. If, for example, your model is not very well regularized. So what you what you should focus on, I think, for the theory agreement is just uh, um, this left part uh, of the of the experiment, um, because this is trying to be in a regime where um, N is much smaller than D. But just as a, a artifact of our experiments, we had finite amount of D. So there's a point at which N becomes of order D and then um, we wouldn't observe power loss scaling, we see a crossover to a different behavior. So actually all of these curves are kind of um, uh, uh, what, what, what you would uh, actually observe is like, this is sort of one half of uh, one portion of a regime. There's a crossover that happens and you would actually uh, end up in this regime if you were on the other side of that okay. crossover. Okay. Makes sense. Makes sense, thank you very much. Cool. Okay. Next question is by Peter. Perhaps the alpha D to alpha W transition is a function of a variance of the data versus variance of the model parameters. What do you think about that? Um, I, I'm not quite sure what the alpha D to alpha W transition is. Is it, um, Describing this transition, Peter, if you are there, uh, if you can clarify your I just question, just unmuted. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I just uh, I have limited experience in this field, so I'm, I'm I may be saying things that don't make any sense, but it seems to me uh, you're you're in you're going from one domain to another with these. You know, with the difference and differences, and it seems like the variance, certainly the variance in the data, is going to affect how well these things perform. And you alluded to that, I think, in some of your other slides. But there's also uh, the way the model is defined, and how good your model is in terms of matching. The real physics of the model. There's going to be a, there's going to be variances in the in the uh, model parameters as well. And I would I would think that 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 so what I'm trying to say is I could imagine a situation where you have a very good model and there really isn't a lot of variance in the model parameters. You just have to figure out what they are. And if you have enough and but you get a bunch of variance in your data. And if you get enough, the more and more data you get, the tighter and tighter your your model gets to predicting the model parameters, um, and then and then the other end of that regime is, uh, you um, you're very good at measuring your 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 um, your data. You have very little uncertainty in your data. Uh, so I'm mean, vice versa to what I just said. Sorry, I, I I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm just throwing that out there. You no, know, that's also a great question. Um, so a couple of points. So I, I think the variance that you're alluding, you, you alluded to maybe things that I would separate. So there's uh, like the variance of the data coming from uh, the fact that uh, you subselected some amount of data there. So it's like a finite batch. There's a finite size to it. Maybe you also have uncertainty in your regression targets. That's also a source of variance. These things, um, uh, there's also another source of variance from model parameters coming from the choice of initialization and randomness of the optimization. Um, so each time you run an optimization and you choose the initialization and so on, you may get a slightly different model. So these sources of variance are actually, both in the theory and these experiments, have been sort of averaged out. So if I go back to the way I kind of defined my setup, well, model um, model error versus data error. That's really what I'm go where I'm going to with this, and I think that's what you're trying to to explain here. I I hope. <laughs> uh, so it, how they relate to? It's actually um, we actually don't I think touch about touch on that too much. So the way I kind of defined I didn't go into this, but 
we are in our theory problem and many of these other theory problems, we average out over those other sources of, of variance. So expectation over D here means averaging over the draws of a finite size D, capital D, samples. So I pick different batches and that, those have different variances, but I'm gonna average over that to get, at least understand the average effect. I'm also gonna average over the choice of random initialization um, and in the experiments, what we're doing, and you're you're right that if you went out and just measured, we we do do a little bit of this averaging um, to produce these empirical results. So like you would do multiple runs from different initializations. We draw different batches of data so we can match, uh, you know, so we can have some connection to the theory. If you went out right now and ran a model um, uh, with you know, if you tried to do this experiment, what you would find are, are are plots that are curves that actually do have a lot more randomness in them because of that. Now, especially in kind of smaller scale, smaller data, smaller model size regimes. Now, in these other settings, like large language models, um, the models and the data set sizes are so large that essentially they become self-averaging. So they, when they run, like, if they were to look at the variance between different runs, they don't see a lot of randomness. So there is, um, depending on the absolute sizes of these things, the amount of data and the model size, there is this randomness or a variance that I've averaged out over here and you would observe, um, uh, and, and that matters as well. And you're totally right to, to ask about that. But there's a second uh, part to your question where you said, like, how well does the model fit to uh, the data? Kind of an alignment. Does the model have the right inductive bias? Does it align well to the data? And that's the question that we're trying to get at uh, in this um, in, in this work and, and others in theory. So like there, you, you want to average, just to even understand that problem, you want to average out all the other sources of randomness. And even there, the, the value of alpha D and alpha W um, in these two regimes that I mentioned uh, on the off-diagonal kind of categorizations or tables, they do depend on this alignment. It's, it's essentially a, a how well uh, your model aligns to the data. And in this kernel setting, there's actually a precise notion of that. Hmm. Okay. I do, to paraphrase what you just said, uh... Well, I'm not exactly sure, but I, 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 I understand where you're going. I'm not sure I understand how it Im, the implications for the various variables. But so when when you're in a the worst, I guess what I'd like to the question I want to ask is the the better your model is, the better your model fits the actual data. How does that change? It sounds like that reduces the 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 alpha d or the alpha w am i getting that right it it uh, increases it so it's there's a it steeper increases. slope in general hmm. there's okay. there's an addition there's a constant shift to all of these that we can't oh, these are oh yeah alpha is the power law parameter alpha okay. is the so, power law yeah, yeah so that would make sense it would the higher the increase the steeper the slope the better you get okay yeah, so that's true, and that amount of alignment, so the, the constant shifts we can't say much about there, um, theoretically, but at least the efficiency, the, the rate of improvement, so the slope of these lines mm -hmm. uh, does is governed by some notion of alignment between the model and the data. And actually in the setting of kernels or Gaussian processes, you can, that's that's now well understood. It It is actually literally like an alignment between the regression values and eigenvectors of this matrix. Um, and so these would be, these are actually things that you could measure ahead of time just to kind of have an assessment, at least for kernels and Gaussian processes, how well they, you know, whether they're good models for the data, just simply by looking at these eigenvalues and looking at the eigenvectors. I, I think, are you saying that you could use, potentially use this to, as an assessment of the quality of your model? For, for kernels and Gaussian processes, I think you could. Um, for neural network models, there isn't an exact, because of these actual, so this all is kind of based on these infinite width results that I mentioned. Mm. Um, 
So, but for for finite with neural networks, there's no such kind of uh, exact notion. There's maybe some heuristics that are similar that you could use. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, and thank you, Yasanan, for answering the question. And next, do you have a time, by the way, Yasanan? It's past. I, I do. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Okay, the next question is by Kevin. Is there a way to initialize weights and bias of a finite sized neural network so that it approximates GP kernel with desired hyperparameters? Oh, that's a good um, interesting question. Question. Um, so if you take the finite sized network already, and you just um, choose the, you can choose the initialization of the weights and the biases. So there are these um, variances, sigma squared W, sigma squared B that I didn't write down, but I alluded to. Those show up in the kernel as well. If you choose those to be the same, then the finite size network with finite size hidden layers, already you could use those feature vectors to construct the kernel. Mm -hmm. And it would be like a finite size approximation to the kernel. It may not be the optimal one, so there might be actually mathematically smarter things that you could do. But it is true that if you took those, if you just took, for example, the um, representations of a randomly initialized neural network um, uh, of finite size and took those feature vectors and used them to construct like a covariance matrix, it would be like a, it would be some, um, uh, like a kernel matrix. That matrix, as you make the width larger, is exactly the kernel. So um, that is a finite size approximation mm. of it. I guess you can use that as an initial uh, weights and bias and then let it train with the finite size of the neural net, whatever the data you have. That might be a strategy. Well, that, I guess, so for a GP, um, uh, for, for, the, take... for, for the neural net, not, not the GP. But you, could you maybe say the question, would you like to train the neural network in a different way? Yeah, I mean, you start with a weight and bias, if it is corresponding to the GP kernel uh, with a desired hyperparameter. And they use that in a, as an initial guess of weight and bias. And then uh, train them using, um, you know, the data you have. Oh, so so figure out this is like figure out the optimal hyperparameters mm -hmm. weight and biases from the GP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And use that Motiv as yeah, motivated by the GP. Yeah. Yeah, you you could do you you could do that. I I actually suspect it might not make too much of a difference as long as you're there are some pretty good regimes of weight and bias variances for neural networks that have been calculated. And as long as you're kind of in that regime, so nothing too kind of pathological, a lot of neural networks end up uh, giving good results, mm -hmm. at least if you have enough data and the model size is large enough. So I suspect performance wise, it might not have a big effect, um, but, but you certainly could do that. Right. Kevin, do you have a follow up question? Um, I think, I think that's uh, good enough. Uh, explanation thank you so much okay uh next question is by hannah nelson um she's saying i interpreted the graphs as being in terms of train error should we expect similar scaling results on data which is outside our collected data that's a great question yeah so these graphs were the were um uh plotting the the test error but the, it's true that they're, um, the, the evaluation and the training data are from the same distribution. So it's an in-distribution setting. And if you um, we're going to look at the test error on out-of-distribution data, um, so uh, many works have done that. Um, uh, they do see um, scaling laws, uh, but it, it actually, they, they can get very different kinds of behavior. So sometimes, you know, when the data, it really just depends on the out of distribution data and how well it aligns to the like pre-trained trained model. So there are cases where it improves with these other scaling variables, but maybe after a certain scale, it actually gets worse. Um, sometimes it just improves monotonically. Sometimes it gets worse monotonically. So there's been all sorts of um, uh, kind of 
uh, types of behaviors observed, um, and it's a great thing to do, I think. Um, but it's really there. There isn't much control uh, on it. Okay, and um, she also has another comment or question. Yeah. Oh, she says this is test data. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, okay, she's saying the more parameters doing better with the scaling things reminds me of accuracy boost from bootstrap aggregations in tree classifiers. Another question from her, I've seen it thrown around that the curves of graphs of training loss can be used to approximate the dimension of the manifolds of the dis distributions we are trying to learn. In your opinion, is this a sound practice? Um, I think it's going to be a pretty noisy estimate. Unless maybe there's a specific setting that you're thinking of where there are some like rigorous or semi rigorous results. Um, I kind of the plots that I showed where there was a correlation between the exponent and some measurement of the data manifold, which I also didn't specify or get into the details of was sort of loose. Um, I think estimates of dim manifold dimensionality are um, uh, are tricky to get right. Um, and, and kind of noisy on their own. And so um, I think also the relationship between those two can be um, maybe not super robust, unless there's maybe a specific setting that you're thinking of, to, to my knowledge. Hmm. Awesome. Okay. I have a question. Um, well, I have a tons of questions. I, I was fascinated by your Gaussian process kernel, you know, the method. Um, but let me ask another question related to the you know, the slide you showed um, in introducing as a active research area right now about by choosing certain uh, training data uh, selectively, you can get much better scaling laws. Yeah. And that one that um, is very attractive to us, especially because the da data we are getting uh, is usually associated with a high fidelity you know, the computational model simulations and, you know, just getting one data is, is very costly. So we, we want to choose those, you know, the training data very wisely so that when we train the either neural network or Gaussian uh, model or some other data driven approach, we would like to, uh, you know, get the much better scaling low convergence, right? With the, as few as data as possible. Since those data is coming from physics simulations, we can utilize this a lot of like the physical prior knowledge, right? Um, you know, the conservation of low, um, each physics has a different uh, the physics property to satisfy. What would be your insight? Like, um, you know, do you think, you know, using those domain knowledge from the physics side and bringing it into those sampling um, you know, training data sampling procedure um, will will be essential to give us a this you know much better scaling or convergence uh, behavior. Uh, abso absolutely, yeah. I think I I do think that in um and uh, in low data regimes and and small models, certainly the more um, inductive, the more intuition you put into it, I think the better in general it can do. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I think it's kind of a really an ongoing question. What are the best heuristics to use even on the ML side? Um, so, so I, yeah, I would say, I, I think I would trust personally, if I were working in a domain, I, I knew well, I would trust my intuition actually for how to do that subsampling at the moment. I can say that, um, in these regimes often. Uh, well, there are a number of heuristics out there since this paper was published, but one thing that people have been doing is um, kind of, kind of in a way, it's a form of cheating because, and I think this is what this paper had done, which was kind of um, use a large, there was a larger model that was trained on this data set that was used to suggest kind of um, to, to pick the example. So maybe the places where there was greatest error, I don't quite remember the the metric, but one of the catches was, um, and in a lot of large scale ML settings, they kind of, um, one of the catches is that they might have already access to some large model to point them to uh, 
uh, to which subset they might want to keep. Mm. And then they might build mm. something like a foundation data set. So just pruning the data, the original data set, that is, let's say, a benchmark data set that everybody uses mm -hmm. to some subsampled um, set um, that is then fixed and, and others would use that to train on. And one of the things that's been kind of observed is that um, maybe a lot of models, at least in these other like kind of mainstream ML communities that are used, kind of share um, they have similar notions of what is a good example or a hard example, you know, a hard example or an easy example. So that therefore the mo the large model that is sort of like a teacher can kind of point, can, can that signal that you would use from a larger model that is like a teacher is actually useful for a smaller model. But this might not transfer across domains and so on. So this mm -hmm. is one of the ways that people have been kind of getting around this. Um, uh, by by kind of bootstrapping and kind of using this, having access to this teacher model to mm. produce that pruned data set that then is actually pretty good for small models that you would then train on with fewer data, uh, with fewer samples. Mm. All right. Well, thank you, Yasaman, uh, for the uh, wonderful uh, talk and as well as you know the wonderful the Q and A sessions. I I think we have to let you go. <laughs> we yeah. we want to keep you longer, but I, you know uh, we we would like to respect your your schedule too. Uh, so we are so happy that uh, you uh, came to us and then gave a, a wonderful talk and you know uh, give us chance to discuss things. Um, hopefully, after this, um, if you allow, maybe the collaboration oh. is is encouraged, um, then we can actually do the collaborations on some of the scientific discovery through this Gaussian and wonderful research on this neural network scaling law. Uh, it, is it, it, do you think it's a... Uh, oh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to chat further and discuss. Okay, okay, yeah. Please, audience, uh, please reach out to Dr. Barry and uh, um, for the future collaboration, I will do uh, myself, um, you know, for the future collaboration, reach out to you. Okay, with that, uh, let's end our seminar today, and it was wonderful seminar. Okay, let me push the stop button for the record.